everyone. This is Lynn Crawford from Hope Dementia Support. And this evening, we have a very important topic about dementia and driving. And we are fortunate enough to have uh, Sue Doyle here from OT Lifestyle Solutions. And uh, uh, I think that, that, Sue, do you have your slides? Yeah. Okay, because I was going to ask you if you wanted to uh, introduce yourself because you know so much more about you than I do. I don't know. You've known me for a while. For a while. The one thing I do want to ask people, though, is to uh, um, you can put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And at that point, I will... Turn it over to you, Sue. Yeah, hi. So um, <clears throat> I'm an occupational therapist. I've been in OT for 42 years now and um, have done various roles um, across a few different countries. But uh, one has been involved in driving and one of those things that it always comes up in terms of concerns um, for all of us as we age. And so I thought we'd just have a look a little bit at driving and dementia and some of the things and answer some of your questions. But let's take a look at that. And the first reason that we're concerned is that as we age, um, driving ability changes. The number of older drivers is actually growing rapidly just because the number of seniors is growing rapidly. And in our generations, Getting a license was a big deal. You know, a lot of us waited, couldn't wait till we could drive, unlike some of the current generation that is still 24 or 30 and haven't received their license. The other thing that's interesting is that all the drivers are currently driving longer distances. Um, and that's kind of a very interesting statistic when you think about it, but to think that we're doing more distances than previously. Um, a lot of that is kind of trying to enjoy more active retirement, trying to be engaged in things, going to visit grandkids that have moved further away, those kinds of things. Um, there's also current research that driving cessation is often associated with negative outcomes. Um, and that motor vehicle accidents have more serious outcomes for seniors versus other age groups. Our bodies just don't recover the same way as we age, and the implications uh, for being involved in an accident can be serious. So can I interrupt you just a second? Can you put uh, your uh, slides in presentation mode? Are you not seeing them? Yeah, what we're seeing is uh, uh, we're seeing uh, the smaller version with the next slide beside it. I am not seeing that on the screen. Let's have a look. It must be the settings in here. Did that do anything? Uh, when you flip back, it was better. You wouldn't think I do this all the time, would you? Well, I know you do it all the time, but I also know technology, so. Yeah. How's that? Right now, your slides are not up. Can you share again? And then can you uh, can you click on from the beginning? There. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. We worked it out. Now people okay. can see it. Um, the other thing is there's no single test or simple algorithm that can identify when someone is no longer safe to drive. And that's kind of being, I've got a couple 
colleagues of mine that have spent 15, 20 years researching this, uh, one of my mentors for my PhD and for my um, earlier research on parapet's decision making, has literally been working on this for 20 something years and still hasn't come up with one good single test. It really is a compilation of a range of things. It's estimated the average man will have six years without the functional ability to drive a car and the average woman 10 years. And this data comes from the National Highway Traffic Safety um, Authority. And so thinking about, have we talked about that in terms of planning for our retirement and planning for what we need to do? The other thing is the American Academy of Neurology um, released to practice parameters for people with dementia and looking at how often their driving ability should be assessed. And they recommended that it should be reviewed every six months. And in fact, when we look at legislation, we'll look a little um, soon at some of the states that have actually taken that and implemented it into their legislation related to driving. And so um, it doesn't say how, but it says that the clinician neurologists should be reviewing part of the data. Karen, and it says that they should be looking at driving and discussing it openly every six months with the client, reviewing any incidents um, related to um, accidents, tickets, hesitation, changes in behavior. And we'll look at some of those as we go on and then potentially some clinical assessments. The interesting thing is we know no two brains are the same. The initial part of the brain involved in dementia, the progression of the disease, the um, cognitive strength and weaknesses, prior behaviors, prior habits, all of those things are very different. And so we don't know precisely what is going to happen inside an individual's brain exactly and when they're driving or how for one person that's going to progressively impact driving over time. So it really is an individual thing, which is also making it more complex. And driving is really complex to start off with. It's highly complex, sophisticated, um, Small changes in response time can impact safety. And we need to remember the issue is with dementia and not the person, which is hard to remember sometimes um, when we're looking at that. But when we look at driving and all of the complicated parts, I thought this was a really nice um, view of all of the areas of the brain involved in driving. And this came from the Hartford. Um, they have a whole thing on uh, driving and dementia. And so I got that from here. But basically, it shows in the frontal lobe, it anticipates danger, decides how to respond to situations, plans, organizes, and carries out that activity. It's the overseeing part, controls the ability to multitask. Um, it also controls the emotional responses, keeps them under control, that delayed gratification or that delayed response that makes you safe in a situation, oversees that problem-solving decision-making, controls memory of habits, muscle movements, body movements. So driving becomes such an automated habit, right? Um, and that's why... For me, it's difficult when I go back and forth between Australia and here because my automatic habits that I learned initially when I learned to drive in Australia don't apply when I'm here. And then I get used to here and then those automatic habits don't apply when I go back home. And that's that function of the frontal lobe. And you have to watch when you're tired because of that. Um, parietal lobe, of course, is that visual spatial, recognition of movement, manipulating objects, kind of bringing in all that information from the senses and coordinating it, um, and then putting vision and touch and face together, which is really important again for identifying how far you are from another car, a pedestrian, you know, the lane markers, all of those kinds of things. Common areas for dementia, are in those frontal and parietal lobes. 
And you'll see some of um, that when people are reporting on what's happening. The occipital lobe, of course, as it implies, deals with the vision responses, but it's not the only part and we're finding it deals with some of the motor reflex responses as well. Now, and then the temporal lobe, which is another common area for dementia, controls hearing, manages memory, processes vision perception again, and then categorizes, categorizes objects. So recognizes that's another car, that's a long track, that's a person in a wheelchair. So that kind of split second identifying objects and being aware of how fast they may potentially move or where they are, how they're going to progress in front of you or around you. Then the cerebellum coordinates voluntary muscle movements, um, maintains balance, holds memory for reflex motor actions, which is really important when you're having to react on a split second to somebody running out in front of you or running the stop sign. Um, then the brainstem looks at controlling reflexes, alertness, and sense of balance. So you can see the whole brain is engaged in um, driving as a skill, but being able to isolate all of those functions and make them work smoothly together is a complicated task. And then when we start looking at some of the different types of areas affected in dementia, which areas of the brain do you commonly hear or um, talk about as being most commonly affected? Anyone got any answers on areas that you hear or see about being most commonly affected? So frontal, temporal is one. Um, parietal, of course, as we've talked about. So usually, generally, we're talking about frontal, temporal, and parietal areas mostly being the areas affected. When we look at driving out the dementia, when I look at this again, it's so variable, but the average time for someone to continue driving after diagnosis is often 28 months. But that can vary just so much because there are so many things involved in making that determination. But when can you expect to be concerned? So generally, if you see a diagnosis of myocognitive impairment, driving is generally considered safe still. But again, you need to look at individual people and again, look at where those skills are affected because sometimes that myocognitive impairment can really be focused on some of the executive function behaviors, which can lead to poor safety judgment in some of those um, behaviors. In early dementia, there's some difficulty with multitasking, increasing time to process information, and people start to forget familiar faces and places and things. Back when that American Academy of Neurology statement was put out about driving in dementia, they felt like that people should stop driving in early dementia. That now has been lifted and said that it should be evaluated individually in that it could be between early and mid-stage dementia when they recommend people stop driving, again, depending on their individual behaviors. But in that mid-stage dementia, you're seeing more obvious confusion, difficulty organizing, planning, following instructions and problem solving, impaired judgment, wandering, and Significant variability between performance between days. So one day may be really good and the next day may not work so well. So this is kind of, of course, in that stage where you're going to have some significant concerns. But what are those concerns going to look like? We'll talk about shortly. But when we look at some of the rating scales, the commonly used one by the neurologist is the clinical dementia rating score. And so when we use that score to look at what's happening, um, what we can see is that if they score zero, that's normal, no problem. If they score 0.5, that's very mild dementia. 
And usually that puts them the same risk as a younger male driver or someone who's DUI, but they're under the 0.08. Okay, so they've had a little alcohol, but they're still not registering as the unsafe on the DUI scale, but they're still kind of a little bit risky. A score of one or higher is a significant risk for increased crashes and poor driving performance. So you can see again here that score puts someone in the mild dementia and moderate dementia area. And so that is really an area. Okay, um, and so uh, again, this is a test that's usually used by neurologists to come up with a rating scale. So we don't see that a lot from the therapist, but you will see that with the neurology. But thinking about warning signs, have you noticed changes in your driving lately? Are other drivers honking at you? I think that was the saddest thing the last time my dad picked me up from the airport. My father um, is retired military. He was a mechanic and a driving instructor for the army in Australia. And so he was a driving instructor for many years in the, in the military. And um, the last time he drove and picked me up from the airport, it was a three hour drive back to my parents' home. And I had never felt so unsafe in a car in a long time. All these other drivers, that's like, I don't know what's with this younger generation. They're always honking your horn at me. And I'm like, Dad, you straight across the lane. There are these issues here. I can understand why they're honking your horn at you. But just being aware, that may be a sign. Do you feel less confident driving and now find yourself driving less because of that? Yes, Bill, that's one. We're going to get to that new stretches on the car. Um, have you become lost um, when you're driving and suddenly forget where you're going? Um, forgotten what you're going to do, um, what's next on your list? Have you mixed up the brake and the gas pedal? And I think we've had two of those here in Vancouver in the last month where somebody hit the gas pedal instead of the brake and ran into a store. Thankfully, there weren't any major injuries from that, from memory, but those are definitely factors to look at. And here's that one, Bill. Have you had any accidents or minor fender benders in the last year? And have you received any traffic citations in the last year? And this can be things for going too slow and going too fast, um, or it can be for you know running lights, stopping in an intersection, um, unsafe behavior. So some of those things. And have others criticized or mentioned something about your driving? So those are just little warning signs to take note of. But how to put out this list um, that families can use in the Hartford um, package. And so it's decreased confidence, difficulty turning to see when backing up. I just use my backup camera now. Um, riding the brake, easily distracted, um, other drivers honking their horns, which we talked about, incorrect signaling, so signaling too late, signaling too early, not signaling at all, or signaling to turn left but turning right, those are common ones. Difficulty parking within a defined space, hitting the curb, scrapes and dents on the car, the mailbox, or the garage door. Increased agitation or irritation when driving. Failure to notice important activities on the side of the road. And failure to notice traffic signs. Trouble navigating turns. Driving at inappropriate speeds. So again, it may not be just too fast. It may actually be too slow. Um, and in fact, officers can and will pull people up for driving too slow. Because to them, that's a warning sign that the person is really having trouble with their driving. And often people who are drunk drive slower, thinking they're going to avoid attention. Um, not anticipating potential dangerous situations. Using a co-pilot, and we'll talk a little bit more about co-pilot later on. Um, bad judgment on making left-hand turns, and then they feel like they have to race out in front of the traffic. Um, or sitting there and not being able to move at all. 
Neon misses, delayed response in unexpected situations, moving into the wrong lane. Um, this is, you know, coming off roundabouts or taking turns and they're into the wrong lane and into oncoming traffic. Difficulty maintaining lane position is a really big one as well. When we know that when people start having difficulty maintaining lane position and staying in the center of their lane, that um, that is a real concern um, and indicating that there's going to be ongoing problems. Um, confusion at exit, not knowing which way to turn and not knowing how to come off the exit safely. Um, getting ticketed for moving violations and warnings, getting lost in familiar places, having had an accident, failure to stop at a stop sign or a red light, confusing the gas and the brake, and stopping in traffic for no apparent reason. In those last two, um, if people confuse the gas and the brake pedal or they stop in traffic for no apparent reason, they should stop driving immediately and have an assessment for further behaviors. The other is a collection of putting all of those together, looking at the frequency and the incidents related to them. Again, reinforcing that a lot of those early warning signs are drifting out of the lane or drifting across the lane and then having to correct, not being able to maintain your lane positioning, becoming confused with entering or exiting the highway, left-hand turns, of course, when I first had my driving test in the US, when she took me out for the assessment, all I got was all right hand turns. And I said to her, I said, why did you take me on that course? I came from driving on the other side of the road. This is an easy one. This doesn't make sense because a left hand turn is so much more difficult. And you'll see people who plot their route out to go to a store or go somewhere where they only do right-hand turns or straight turns so that they can avoid these difficult left-hand turns. Getting lost in familiar places and stopping inappropriately, such as a green light or in the middle of an intersection when they're not turning, thinking and having to process with what's going on there. All right, so if you are riding with someone, then definitely, Um, definitely the person who's writing and familiar with that person can also make some observations. Are you comfortable writing with them? Would you allow your grandkids to ride with them? Are others forced when you're so mad to uh, drive defensively to accommodate that person's driving? Is the co-pilot needed to navigate the automobile or to alert the person of potential hazardous events and conditions. And that's what we'll talk a little bit about co-piloting um, later because there's one form where co-piloting is safe, but there's one form when it's not. Does the person with dementia seem lost or not know where they're going? They start off fine and then they get lost or forget what's happening. Um, often what happens in this situation is that they're on a familiar route, but all of a sudden there's uh, some roadworks and that part of the road is blocked and they have to take a, a detour around and the detour confuses them and then they get lost. And this happened to a couple of people a few years ago and one ended up in the mountains and didn't make it and one ended up in uh, Eugene. Um, because their normal route was blocked and then they ended up not knowing how to navigate around that and problem solve and then got lost. The other thing to think about, have other complex IADL or instrumental ADLs become um, difficult as well? Things like medication management, banking tasks, cooking tasks, shopping tasks. Because if you're seeing this overall change in these complex tasks and the ability to do those, then you're likely to be seeing something that may be impacting the overall um, perceptions and ability to drive. So when you're talking about a family member here, what can they do? So 
what we want to be able to do is to document or monitor some of this, but we need to be really careful not to be obtrusive in the car. This is not, I'm sitting in the front seat writing this down all the time because that is really going to make it more difficult for them to drive and focus. But you do want to be able to record some of these things afterwards and keep notes on it. So consider the frequency and severity of the incidents, things like crossing over the lane, getting honked at, stopping in terms of intersection. Major inter incidences, of course, may warrant immediate action. So you may have to speak up if you're in the car for safety range. Looking for changes in driving, looking for patterns. So one mistake versus a trend or versus several or versus we were just having one or two every now and then to now this is happening every time we go out. Um, those kinds of patterns are going to help determine if the skills have changed. Avoid alarming reactions unless they're warranted due to safety though, and then track the observations like I talked about over time, because that's gonna give a good indication of have things changed and should we be um, making different choices here? Okay. Um, the other thing about tracking that is, we, um, if we got one scare or one thing that upset us a little bit, we were having a bad day, we tend to think that that one incident reflects a whole big problem when it could be just one minor incident. So it helps us avoid overreacting, but it also helps us avoid underreacting so that we can actually see there's a pattern of changes there. And then the other thing is it's kind of not an emotional I'm getting very stressed, I'm really worried about this um, kind of reaction to it. I've got some objective data. This is about these behaviors, not about you or not about me. You're able to record these specific behaviors that are concerns that are coming from the dementia. And it can help the person with dementia sometimes understand the situation a little better. But it also may help take some of the defensiveness out of it if you're able to look at it in a more objective way. The other thing is that these um, observations over time can be much more useful than just a one-time professional assessment um, in some situations because it tends to show how things have changed or a progression or where the highest safety risks are. So who is on the team and who can be involved in, um, in this kind of uh, assessment? Well, physician, of course, and we'll talk about Washington state law and physician responsibilities coming up, um, or the nurse practitioner or the nurse. The pharmacist, because in fact, there's a lot of medication issues that can impact driving, we'll talk about that. The occupational therapist um, and the certified driving rehab specialist who is usually an occupational therapist with more training. Social worker to look at alternatives and other programs, family members, and of course the senior driver should be all part of this decision-making team. So what does Washington State law um, have to say? Well, interestingly, um, it's very different to several other states. So if we were in California, for example, and you got a diagnosis of dementia, by law, the physician who makes that diagnosis needs to notify the motor vehicle's licensing form. It is not an immediate suspension of your driver's license, but it is an immediate notification that you're at risk. And it does actually require them to review your license every six months once you have that diagnosis. And that's a mandatory reporting. They also do protect the healthcare professional who reported it and um, protect them from privacy legislation and consumer. In Oregon, the same similar thing applies is protection for a healthcare professional who reports someone who has a significant impairment in driving in dementia and cognitive impairment is one of those diagnoses that is allowed to be reported. In Washington State, 
there is no such kind of legislation. So what happens is that your vision, you have to have adequate proof that it's adequate every renewal period. Um, and over 70, you must renew in person so that that test can be done in person there. You can report an unsafe driver, and we'll look at those forms in a minute. There's two ways of those being reported. But the information is not kept confidential. So if you um, report an unsafe driver, that person or their attorney will have access to that form and to the name of the person that reported it, unlike in the other two states that we talked about where that information is protected and there is no liability issues for the healthcare provider who does that in good faith. Um, so that's kind of some of the things there. So this form that we're looking at here is the driver evaluation request form. And this is based on reporting someone that you think is unsafe. And so you've concerned that they have one or more of the following conditions that are going to affect their ability to drive safely, either a medical condition, a vision condition, or poor driving skills. And you can actually go ahead and provide an explanation. And you need to provide a good explanation or they will actually just ignore it. And then this can be provided by a law enforcement officer, right? And they will check if there was actually a collision involved in the reason why they're reporting this. It can be a medical professional or it can be a concerned citizen. So those are ways that you can report an unsafe driver in Washington state. Now there is one more option here for healthcare professionals. And this one is reporting based on the medical professional doing an examination. And this is the one that's often filed by the MD after they put together the information related to the driving assessment or their opinion on that based on the test. And notice that dementia and cognitive impairment is one of the conditions they can look down here. And have you noticed the decline over the past 12 months, yes or no? And so um, that is their professional opinion. They're able to give that. They've examined the person. They're stating here's what they're doing. And then in your professional opinion, is this person able to safely operate a motor vehicle? Yes, no, unsure. If no, have you advised this person not to drive? And then should they monitor this, this person? How frequently? So the onus here is on the healthcare provider information and looking at monitoring that and filling that in. The goal really is to keep the adult driver mobile and in the community as long as possible. But the state licensing official is the only agency that can really officially take away a driver's license. So while as healthcare professionals, we can make recommendations, we can't officially take away driver's licenses. I can tell you I've done assessments where the person is definitely not safe. I have sent the information to the um, licensing board and um, the person came back into the clinic to see me. I was three feet away on their left side and they're going, where's Sue, where's Sue? I want to tell her I passed the driver's license test and I was three feet away from them on their left side. I had sent them in because they had a significant left field out of the stroke and it was a neglect. They were unable to compensate for it, and so they weren't safe. And obviously, again, the circumstances when they were looking for me showed that they weren't safe, but they had actually passed the reassessment from the DMV. So it's not always a full safe mechanism, um, but it's the best we have in the state currently um, that we can um, use. So any questions on this so far? I think I answered the other ones that I've seen come up. 
So um, there are some self-assessment tools if you're concerned about that. Um, and then I can give you copies of the slides to send out. But AAA yeah. has what they call roadwise review, and you can just Google that. And there's um, an assessment that you can do there with senior driver safety and mobility. Um, AARP has an are you a safe, um, are you a smart driver? And um, then there's a driving decisions workbook, which is actually quite a good workbook, but it's uh, quite a few pages um, to go through making decisions about driving and also about um, making decisions about um, driving cessation and planning for that, just like you plan in a will or like you plan um, for a power of attorney, et cetera. And then uh, Florida, University of Florida, has a fit to drive assessment that's available. And as a caregiver or partner, you can um, go on there and you can rate on some of the safe behaviors and you can print out a report that you can then take to a dry a to a physician visit with you for a discussion piece related to the person's driving or non-driving um safety. So I want to just talk about some other medical concerns that come up that should trigger some concerns and the physician should at least for a period of time talk about not driving. One of them, of course, is a heart attack, acute um, MI, acute stroke or brain injury, new or acute changes where you may have atrial fibrillation or bradycardia because we're unsure acutely what's going to happen next, lightheadedness and dizziness, orthostatic hypertension where it gets really bad, syncope or pre syncope, vertigo, seizures, surgery like I wasn't allowed to drive for several weeks with my wrist surgery, um, delirium from any cause, and any new sedating medication that could cause sedation or um, confusion or dizziness until you have worn, um, worn in that new um, period and looked at how it um, is affecting you. Chronic conditions that need to be reviewed and may impact driving, of course, cataracts, diabetic neuropathy, macular degeneration, glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa, field cuts, as we just discussed, low acuity, even after correction. So those are some of the visual conditions. Uh, cardiovascular disease, arrhythmias again, unstable coronary syndrome, palpitation, CHF, hypertrophic, obstructive cardiomyopathy and valvular disease. Because these can all cause some sudden cardiac events allowing you not to be able to um, maintain control of the vehicle. Neurological diseases, again, they put in here dementias, that multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, peripheral neuropathy, brain injury, spinal injury, um, psychiatric Diseases such as mood disorder, depression, anxiety, psychotic illnesses, personality disorders, alcohol and substance abuse, and even diabetes, particularly where you have large swings in blood sugars and hypothyroidism, because those can again impact your safety overall. So if you have any of these chronic conditions combined with dementia, you should be talking to your physician about how this is impacting your driving and how you can work to improve these conditions or to become more stable on medication so that they're not impacting that as well. Arthritis and foot abnormalities, contractures, inflammation and pain, um, particularly things like you know, an ankle injury on the right foot, um, those kinds of things. Uh, respiratory disease, uh, COPD or obstructive sleep apnea is a big one. A lot of people experience that, but it really puts you to sleep when you're driving um, very quickly. A lot of people find because they're not getting good nighttime sleep, then you know you add the middle of the day and driving, and then of course next thing you know you doze off and you're drifting across the lane um, or off the road. Chronic renal failure, uh, cancer, and chemo are all some other things to look out for. 
we said before that um, having a pharmacist as part of your um, team is important because looking at medications that can impact your driving and looking at how they interact together. So anticholinergics, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, antiemetics, antihistamines, antihypertensives, anti-Parkinsonian agents, biazidet, benzodiazepines, and um, other sedatives, muscle relaxants, stimulants, hypnotics, and other um, agents with anticholinergic side effects. So those are all important things as we get older. You know, we're looking at people now being on five to 10 medication, having a serious discussion if it's impacting the driving to how your physician review the medications as well as any of the other conditions with dementia because these are going to complement, complicate some of the things that you can see from the dementia related to driving safety. So when we look at driving for planning for older driver safety, we really need to look at overall assessments. And so the clinical assessment of driving related skills usually falls on the occupational therapist, not always. You will see some physicians will do it, you will see some psychologists, but generally speaking, occupational therapists does that clinical skills. We do the driving history, we look at IADLs and ADLs, we have some questionnaires, we look at medication issues, we look at vision, fields, contrast, acuity, we look at cognition in terms of distracted and divided attention, uh, sustaining attention, problem solving. We then look in terms of range of motion, proprioception, balance, rapid, rapid walking pace. And this is to help us identify some of the things that may take you at risk to be slower to responding and also to be um, less aware of your environment and be able to sustain your endurance needed for driving. So when we've done that, we can identify whether someone's at risk or not. If someone's at risk, then we're going to go on and make a decision about do they need further evaluation or do they need intervention? For example, are there medical conditions that we can deal with? Are there things that are optimized? Do we need to wait if someone has a stroke? We need to wait a period of time and let the body heal a little bit before we start to say driving is absolutely out. The same thing can happen with dementia as well. If you're hospitalized and then have a flare up of delirium, um, but that this is not your normal state in that you may go back to that mild cognitive impairment or that mild dementia level once the delirium has resolved. Have we looked at resolving that? How does that work? And then do we need to look at some of the vehicle adaptations, training, um, specialized on the road assessment uh, to or simulator to look at some of those pieces. If it's just a physical disability, we can adapt the vehicle to help with that. We can fit the vehicle better to the person. I think everyone should have a car safe fit. Um, I used to train my students at the university to do these and we have offered them to the community twice a year. But your car should be fitted to you so that your positioning and your ability to see what's going on around you and to be able to check blind spots and everything is optimized. And so there are definitely ways to do that. And then there are ways to add small adaptations such as wider and extended rear view mirrors, wider and extended side mirrors. Now with some of the new electronic uh, safe uh, lane detection and uh, passing detection, those things also help. But there are ways to help compensate as well so that the vehicle provides you with a better fit and better safety. Then when you look at those, if we look at a driving um, deficit that's identified, we need to look to see if some of the restrictions that we can recommend still allow for safe driving, or if that person needs to stop driving, or if they need to wait and revisit. 
um, because those can all be factors that come into play. Like I said, sometimes um, if you've had a hospitalization and you've got a biocognitive impairment, it's really easy to have um, that flare up into a delirium or if you're in that mild stage of early stage of dementia, it's very easy again for any hospitalization to trigger the delirium response. And so we really want that to come down to see where we're at to see if writing is still safe to resume. So areas again that OT um, generally assesses in clinical assessment, visual acuity field, cognition, so memory, visual perception, attention, selective, divided, executive function, um, thinking, driving is an overlearned skill. But when something goes wrong, that's the thing that we need to prepare for as well when it's an unpredicted situation. And then we have to look at the person's insight. Um, and definitely that's a consideration when you're talking about someone with dementia because often that insight may be difficult. Um, motor and some somatosensory function. Uh, do I know where my feet are? Do I know whether my foot's on the brake or on the accelerator, endurance, functional range of motion, um, appropriate fashion. I use a driving off-road assessment battery that has been developed with research out of Australia to test all of these things within clinic, um, which gives me a good screening idea about what is the baseline and should we be moving further forward. Is the person then safe um, to look at an on-road assessment or are there concerns that have come up. But what we usually get with the physical capabilities is things like histories of falls, impaired ambulation, vision and hearing impairments, um, functional impairments with regard to the use of the gas or the brake pedal, a decreased neck range of motion, short-term memory destructibility, difficulty picking up new information, and again, that will be showed in things like not using turn signals, difficulty turning and staying in the lane, judging distances between cars and exits, hitting curbs when parking or backing up, um, stopping inappropriately, that's a big one again, not following stop signs or yield signs, people not seeing yield signs, not noticing that they're there and using them to stop not noticing workmen or activity on the side of the road, inappropriate speeds for the weather and driving conditions and history of traffic uh, violations or accidents. So we see um, simulators and on-road assessments being used. And there's various simulators and programs. There's some limited research connecting them to accidents, but it seems a pretty realistic thing, particularly some of the newer ones, some of the older systems. Some of the visual images are really old and ancient. Some of the pictures and some of the response time is very difficult and different from new cars. But some of the new simulators are very helpful for identifying risks before you put the driving assessor or the client um, in a risky situation out on the road. They also allow for standardization. That means that we can repeat the same test time over time which is really important to look across populations, to look at who's safe and who's not. It's also really important to look at changes. Remember when we talked about someone with dementia being reassessed six months to a year? Um, these are some of the tests that we can use that will compare performance over time because you're using exactly the same programming simulation versus if you were out on the road and then one day there's no traffic, one day there's all traffic, one day it's rainy, one day it's not rainy. So you can, um, with the simulator, absolutely be able to compare apples to apples versus apples to oranges. Um, On-road assessments are either done with the certified driving rehab specialist with the car um, that they have equipped and they're acting as the driving instructor or the certified um, driving rehab specialist in a car with a driving instructor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so those are still ways to be looking at getting the best assessment, but often we can identify risk factors that make it very unsafe to go on the road prior to getting there. 
And then we can also, like you said, make recommendations for interventions. The job isn't to just say, okay, you can't drive anymore. In most situations, what you're hoping to do um, is to help maintain driving as much as possible, but you want it to be safe. And so you're looking at the things that we can change or address, such as medication, visual correction, restricting driving um, when there's good contrast, not in rainy weather or not at nighttime, um, looking at some adaptive equipment like we've talked about. And then when we look at that um, assessment, we're talking it can be anywhere depending on how the results go from one to four hour assessment. So you're going to come away from that with a driving plan, a recommendation for continued driving with or without restrictions, um, an interval plan. So when should it be reassessed? For example, if this is early dementia or early Parkinson's, right? This is something that we need to reassess in six months. Um, multiple sclerosis is another one where regular reassessment is going to be uh, recommended. Then we're looking at, could we potentially do um, any interventions to restore some of those things that are causing problems or to compensate for them? Or is this where we need to recommend the older driver needs to cease driving? The thing that comes up overall is thinking and planning about what happens if we can't drive. And so thinking about having this discussion really early on about, <clears throat> okay, what happens if my car broke down? How would I get around? Who can give you a ride? Can you use public transport? Is there public transportation anywhere near you? Is there a shuttle service? Does your community have a volunteer driver service? Um, some senior centers do have that and make it available. We do have... Um, CVAN passes and other passes here in our community that make that is an option. That planning for driving retirement should begin prior to not being able to drive. That is something all of us as we age should be thinking about. Um, as we said earlier, as we age, it's likely that a man will not be driving for six years prior to um I have six years of non-driving and then a woman likely 10 years. So thinking about what that looks like and how do we plan for that, just like we plan for all the other parts of retirement. The thing that we need to be really careful of is if we don't have a plan in place, we get to make poor choices in a hurry. And we also get to make choices where we start to withdraw where we don't get involved in social activities, and then that impacts and becomes a cycle where we get depression, where we get less active, where we get less social engagement, and our cognitive condition deteriorates more um, quickly. So we need to be planning and putting this in place. So when we look at getting an initial diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, or we start to notice our memories are slipping. This is when we should be putting these plans and thinking about it. Not that we're acting on it at that time, but we at least are starting to think and have a plan. So identify our individual driving needs and habits. Assess any family or caregiver readiness to help us with that. Have the clinical team engaged where we're thinking about it, particularly if we've got a diagnosis of Parkinson's or dementia or MS. Create an active plan that can be implemented to avoid the negative impacts. So some of the planning things, the Hartford um, safe driving thing has here, thinking about what are your routine trips, frequency, social interactions that you get from there, what are the periodic trips, what are the occasional trips, so that you list those out. And then we make an active plan to look at who are people around that we can use or utilize for those trips? And then very much writing out the contact information, the costing, the pros and the cons, so that we can have a clear example and um, plan to follow. 
the other thing to think about is making an agreement um, about driving with the family. So, and this one says, the time may come when I can no longer make the best decision for the safety of others and myself. Therefore, in order to help my family make necessary decisions, this statement is an expression of my wishes and directions while I'm still able to make them. I have discussed with my family my desire to drive as long as it is safe for me to do so. When it's not reasonable for me to do to drive, I want such and such, for me it would be my daughter, to tell me I can no longer drive. I would tell her, yeah, right. But you know, I mean, <laughs> this is an agreement plan, right? That we've talked about, we're thinking about this. I trust her, you know, she's going to tell me, and yeah, I might say that, but it really inside, I know that I've agreed this is going to be it, and I trust my family will then take the necessary steps to prohibit my driving in order to ensure my safety and the safety of others while protecting my dignity. This is signed and copied on. So this is kind of, you know, planning in advance, just like with the healthcare directives, et cetera, so that we have an agreement, we thought about the activities, perhaps the backup can in place, looked at what the options are. Um, use of a code timing. Co-pilot. Interestingly, 10% of all men diagnosed with dementia <clears throat> reported using a co-pilot. In this was alerting the driver not just for directions, but for light changes, traffic situations, hazards, etc. So the use of a co-pilot really impacts safety because if that person's got to notify what's got, got to notice what's going on, then got to verbalize it to the other person, then the other person who's the driver has got to respond, we can see that really increases the response time, right? So use of co-pilot for those light changes, traffic situations, hazard identification is really unsafe. Use of a co-pilot for navigation assistance is actually helpful as long as the adult driver can drive safely on their own and respond appropriately to hazards and monitor hazards. Um, so thinking about hmm, def the definition of co-pilot. So co-pilot to respond to hazardous situations, to look at changes, to direct driving responses is not safe. But where the co-pilot is providing directions, then that is an acceptable use as long as the older adult driver is safe with the driving skills. Having the talk. We've talked about planning. We've talked about having that um, discussion agreement. Who's going to tell you when you can't drive? You know, my husband's mother had um, MS, and she had multiple incidents where the police pulled her out for unsafe driving, unable to maintain lane stuff. And so the boys all got together and said, today, you know, we're going to all get together and we're going to talk to mom about not driving and take the keys away. And as they went to do it, um, mom met them at the door and she threw the keys to the youngest boy and said, I'm done with driving. These police officers just won't leave me alone. Um, you get the car from now on. And so that said them, but thinking about being prepared to have that talk. And instead of you just can't drive anymore, how about I'm that I message, I'm concerned for your safety because I'm seeing A, B, and C. Stick to the issue about the driving skills, focus on safety and independence. I understand that this is difficult. I'll help you figure out how to get where you need to go or where you want to go. Um, thinking about using those I statements to help calm it down and reduce the confrontation. When reasoning doesn't work, what do you do? Lose the keys, change the keys, take the car away for repairs, disconnect the battery. But if you do that, remember you have to take all the roadside assistance cards from their, cards from their wallet, the license from their wallet, because otherwise they're going to call and get the battery reconnected. Right? <laughs> It's happened multiple times. Um, thinking about the car keys need to go in an entirely different location to where they've ever been stored before because they'll get found and used. If the person continues to drive around against recommendations, attempt to problem solve, 
and help them look at transportation needs. Again, review with them the information that was used to make the recommendation. Identify the emotional impact of an accident and injuring someone else. Emphasize the financial and legal consequences of driving without a license or insurance because once you have those things written in the record, you no longer have insurance. Um, if there's cognitive impairment and poor decision making, look at options for a designated decision maker to be appointed. And I know that you've all had discussions about powers of attorney and powers of attorney and then people have that. And then you can report again to the state licensing authorities. <clears throat> this is um, insurance coverage for assessments. I should have made that clear. So the cost of a driving assessment um, can vary depending on how, how long it takes and how much um, of the assessment is applicable. Driving assessments provided under an occupational therapy plan of care are covered only when there's a reasonable expectation that the patient's ability to drive will be restored or improved. And this comes straight from Medicare. Okay, this is from CMS.gov. This is an LCD for outpatient occupational and physical therapy. The need for the assessment must be related to the presence of and recovery from a specific injury or illness. Generalized aging, weakness, or debility do not qualify as Medicare covered conditions for assessment or therapy services. An assessment for the sole purpose of disqualifying the patient from driving is not a covered benefit as well. So there are some circumstances where it will be covered under Medicare and you know, the insurances because Medicare generally sets the standard and there's definitely um, circumstances, as you can see here, when it's not going to be covered. All right, any questions? Absolutely. Okay. I have a number of questions that I've been collecting. Okay. So uh, we will start with, what about the families and the caregivers that can't seem to get any help from their healthcare providers? Do you have suggestions or recommendations? So I think one of the things I would do is I would use one of the self-assessment tools, particularly the Florida University one. I would take that information in and I would use the information from the Hartford self-driving and those are linked in the, in the um, slide and take those in. It's very difficult because particularly in Washington state, there is no um, protection for a healthcare provider who does report, um, but they do also have an ethical and moral obligation. So it's kind of a, a mixed situation. I hope that helps a little bit. There is a question about those individuals that have been diagnosed with frontal temporal uh, dementias and they have the, the uh, uh, anger and acting out issues and driving, mm -hmm. uh, which becomes a real challenge. Um, Thoughts, recommendations, experiences? So the, those are some of the hardest to manage because the insight isn't there as well. And so sometimes, sometimes when, when I assess people and tell them they can no longer drive, there's a little bit of anger at me, which is legit, but then there's a really a recognition underneath that this was a legitimate result. For people with chronic temporal dementia, that inside an executive function that does that usually isn't there, and it's very difficult with that. This is where you need a team to work with you in terms of having a game plan. It's also, also something to when you start to look at problems occurring earlier, we should be having these discussions much earlier in the conversation than when we're removing the license or the ability to drive. 
and we really are only reacting now in the crisis situation instead of planning earlier. And so I think until we can start to do that more as a community, um, it's going to be harder. And so trying to get that support system in place, um, and then it really is difficult keeping the people away. Thank you. Um, liability issues. When someone has been diagnosed with dementia and they are uh, continuing to drive mm -hmm. and something something bad happens, is there liability involved? Is there a possibility that insurance would not pay? Yes. Um, that's, that is why California instituted the program that they did where once you get that diagnosis, you get an assessment and then you get assessed every six months. That way, the person has been cleared by the licensing authority to be safe to drive. Um, and so that helps with maintaining that insurance coverage. Um, Washington State, we need to lobby for some better um, rules related to that, to help in that situation, because it's very easy for them to say, oh, you have that diagnosis. One of the things is also to have your healthcare provider who makes that diagnosis work with you on a driving plan so that it's clearly documented in the notes that there's a clinical assessment at this stage that you're safe, or then there's a clinical assessment that they're not safe, and then you have a plan to follow. So what you mentioned about the fact that, that Washington uh, uh, allows there to be, uh, to have the person who, who uh, determine, who turned them in as far as not being a safe driver, um, that explains a lot about the, the difficulty that people often have with the providers helping them. Yeah. Uh, I, I loved what you said about lobbying. I, I think that that is something that we have underestimated the importance of uh, uh, the state legislatures being aware of what's going on. And, and I don't know, I think that that might be something we need to work on. Well, and also because we have models in other states near us and we also have the American Association of Neurologists guidelines, those can be used as guidelines to implement and to look at models that would allow for better coverage in Washington State. And didn't you say that that, that was in, those recommendations came in 2010? Yes. That was 13 years ago. Yeah, exactly. But basically well, what we see when we look at research evidence and guidelines coming down from, from the researchers or from the guideline authorities and going into practice, we're seeing a 17-year gap in that, which is really sad when we look at the current technology and everything that we have available. There's still that delay of getting from the recommendations and the evidence to being implemented in practice that's 17 years or more. Wow. I didn't fully appreciate that. So one of the things that we hear a lot is, well, where can we go? We we think that we have an issue and we'd like him to be evaluated. Where can we go to have that happen? Where is there a simulator? What, what uh, organizations have them? So Peace Health um, Outpatient Neuro has a simulator. So it's outpatient neuro? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because when you go online to try to find something, it's very difficult. So yes. Peace Health, outpatient yes. neurology. Outpatient neuro clinic. The occupational therapist there can do a driving assessment. And uh, uh, anywhere else, are you aware of Legacy yeah. or Kaiser? Not anyone else that has a simulator. No, we really need to get a private practice OT with a simulator. 
Okay. So um, uh, are there, I mean, we know what you do because we know you. Is there anybody else? I mean, is there, do, do OT practices in Vancouver do these assessments? There's, um, there, I'm, I think I'm the only private practice OT that's not fees in Vancouver and I'm actually technically retiring. Okay, well, that's important to know because people are desperate. Yeah. So, so we we kind of have two populations. One is that that they are desperate because they know their loved one shouldn't be driving and they can't get them to stop, or that they don't want to make them stop because it's the last it's the last thing they've got. And gee, they drive okay. It's, it's really important to allow driving as long as possibly safe. But the other thing is it's really important potentially that it's someone else that, that takes that decision away from you and that loved one because one, they're going to need your support and stuff there, but you also don't need any additional conflict or other issues because there's already a lot. And so when that can be moved to the healthcare professional, that's a really good way to have that done. But you're right, trying to find people with those skills. AOTA has a list of certified driving rehab specialists, and I think there are some in them in um, Portland as well. Right. Okay. I can't tell you how helpful this has been. That's good. You, I'm glad. Oh, amazing. So uh, this is everyone's opportunity. If you have any any other questions, I think Sue has done an amazing job of uh, uh, providing answers to almost every question that any of us had. But if if no one has any other questions, we won't uh, uh, we won't keep you knowing that that uh, you still haven't quite recovered from your illness. So we thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. I'm really glad my voice has lasted. <laughs> You've lasted. You've lasted. That's been awesome. So we have a thank you for great information here, which I absolutely agree. And uh, so for everyone else, we will be uh, uh, sending out the slides as well as the Hartford information um, soon. Yeah. And then uh, this is recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel. And, and if it's okay with you, Sue, I would like to post it on Facebook because I just think it's too important to not include. Yeah, sure. So, all right. Well, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Sue. This was amazing. You're welcome. Take care. All righty. Thanks a lot. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, next month we will actually, it's not next month now, it's this month. I'm just testing myself. So uh, the last Tuesday of the month, we will actually uh, be having uh, uh, a program related to fall prevention in the home. This is from Providence. And I can't believe it's been a year ago that that actually Sue and Sam Lewis from Clark County uh, uh, Fire and Rescue covered for our uh, presenter because she was ill with COVID. So it's here we are yeah. a year yeah. later. So, all right. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye.